Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this conference. It's really an honor to be here among you. And I also have been really inspired by our conversations yesterday, and especially the discussion at the end of yesterday about generalist versus specialist approaches to climate and the importance of storytelling. Um, so some of you might be familiar with um, Paul Hawken, who's the founder of Project Regeneration. I'm here representing them. Um, he wrote a book called Drawdown that was published in 2017. And regeneration is similar. It's a very generalist approach, emphasizing the interconnections between the solutions. And regeneration maps over 100 of them and the specific actions that can be taken to support them. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see that? Yes. Yes. All right. So regeneration describes a system of initiatives that can end the climate crisis in one generation. And we only have one generation to end the climate crisis. The most direct and timely solution is the regeneration of living and social systems. So this approach really also highlights the importance of the human, um, the human aspect and social as well as environmental. Uh, it applies, regeneration applies equally to forests, farms, oceans, communities, cities, and governments. And today I'm gonna to be focusing on regenerative land use practices. And I wanted to start with a simple question that can get us thinking and just interacting a little bit more around what regenerative landscapes do. So what are the qualities of a regenerative landscape? What should a regenerative landscape do? You can go ahead and type them in the chat um, based on all of your expertise and all of the examples and discussions that we've had over the past day. Um, what are some of the qualities of a regenerative landscape? Let's make sure I can see the chat. There we go. Right, to create healthy soils, retain water, increase soil life over time. Nice. Biodiversity, yes. Requires no inputs. High biotic activity, uh, resilience, abundance, diversity and as we've been talking a lot about retaining water, enabling life, yes, great. And supporting people, yes, um, people's mood and labor productivity. So beautiful, at, this, at the same time, they are beautiful, they meet human needs and they improve social systems and can even reduce conflict as I'll be discussing today. So last year, after hearing about it for over a decade, I finally had the chance to visit Tamara Eco Village in southern Portugal. Some of you may be familiar with this very unique permaculture based intentional community. When I arrived, I stepped into a landscape that is lush and green, covered in vegetation, and centered around a series of ponds and a beautiful lake. Gardens and orchards supply food to the community of about 200 people and bees, birds, fish, and other wildlife are really abundant, even wild boars. But back in 1995, when Tamara was founded by a group of 30 people who moved from Germany to develop an eco-village, the land was severely degraded. In the summer, it was practically a desert, while in the winter, uh, there was heavy rainfall and often heavy flooding. So through some simple practices of digging swales um, and creating an interconnected system of water retention ponds, they transformed the area. They restored their groundwater supply. And today they serve as a demonstration site for similar projects in the Alentejo region of Portugal. And I share this story because Tamara shows how people can transform the land they live in in order to bring water cycles into balance, as we've spoken so much about, and at the same time, cool the planet and meet human needs. 
So how many of you have been to similar projects in other parts of the world? Go ahead and put them in the chat. And, um, oh, thank you. And I see some, some uh, um, of you have put in the link to Tamara. Um, but if you want to put in the chat any other similar projects that you visited, it might be a good way for us to share those. Finthorn, nice, I see that one. So as many of you have shown yesterday, regenerating landscapes is essential to ending the climate crisis. But as was also discussed, the world has been focused mainly on emissions reduction and cutting emissions is only one piece of the approach. We need to take action simultaneously on multiple levels. So the root cause, we currently practice degeneration as a species, and this has brought us to the threshold of an unimaginable crisis. Regeneration aligns human systems with living systems, is the fundamental solution to global warming. It must be done quickly, and it can. It is possible. Um, so while the crisis is unbelievably overwhelming, there are solutions. There is a global immune response to this virus of degeneration, and it's in the form of this interconnected web of activity that we're calling regeneration. So I'm going to take you to the website at regeneration.org now and introduce you to our rendering of the cascade of solutions. It's about how we design and retrofit our practices as a civilization. As you'll see, many of these solutions have been discussed during this conference. And I'll also show you connected to this cascade of solutions, um, something we're calling Nexus. Nexus is a database of actions that you can take um, around each of these solutions. So it catalogs the pathways to getting the solutions done and also details how to challenge the industries that are getting in the way of achieving these solutions. It details what needs to happen and how to do it on all levels of agency. So from a classroom to a company boardroom to a city hall. So here's starting with some of the land-based solutions as we talked a lot about forests, especially boreal forests, um, afforestation, the planting of forest in regions where previously there was no forest, uh, fire ecology. I'm based in California. As you can see, it's still dark here, still morning. Um, and the fires in wildfires in California and in the West in general have, have been mentioned several times and have been something that have been a serious living reality for me and my family over the past decade. Um, this cascade goes on to mention tropical forests, peatlands, wetlands, proforestation, the idea of protecting the forest that already exists, because as we've mentioned, there's a difference between the way that forests behave and affect the climate, depending on their age and the type of trees. Rewilding, pollinators, wildlife corridors, animal integration was brought up yesterday, and then going into agriculture, agroforestry, regenerative agriculture, and some of the more human um, related solutions such as educating girls and how does that affect climate action and the engagement of more people in that action. Going into energy, wind, solar, grasslands, grazing ecology, and then into cities. We've talked about sponge cities um, several times and um, this talks about buildings, retrofitting our buildings and changing the way that we build. Um, and bringing more nature into cities. And I'm going to focus a little bit more deeply and show you nexus around degraded land restoration. So each of these solutions has a call to action. It tells exactly what we need to do. And the action items for individuals, groups, companies, governments. It talks about some of the bad actors, some of the um, 
the corporations or industries that might be getting in the way of achieving the solution and how to challenge those. Um, some of the key players connecting to the organizations that are specializing in this solution. And then around media, how to learn more, what to watch, read, or listen to. And so uh, I'll be doing a workshop a little bit later today where we can get into a bit more detail and look at some of these solutions and some of the action items. But going back to my presentation, I just wanted to tell you about one more success story. This one is from Southern Africa in Zimbabwe, uh, and it's called the Chikukwa Permaculture Project. So in 1991, a spring which served about 50 households in the Chitikete village for their water supply dried up. And this was a real wake up call, obviously, for the villagers. The residents then had to walk five or more kilometers down um, and up a hill to a more permanent stream in order to fetch water. And this was the culmination of a growing environmental crisis affecting the villages as a result of colonial occupation and years of violence related to the independence struggle. The original forest vegetation had been clear cut and this combined with overgrazing and cropping had destroyed the landscape and it was moving toward desert. During the dry season there, there was a shortage of feed for their cattle, harvests were poor, hunger and malnutrition was common. And then during the wet season, rainwater poured down the hills causing soil erosion. Houses were inundated with silt from above, sometimes reaching up to the window ledges. And most villagers were surviving by selling mono, monoculture crops on the global market. So very little food security locally. The village elders decided to start an initiative to turn things around using a permaculture design approach, which complemented the culture's traditional spiritual belief system. They invited teachers to lead workshops and train local leaders out of which they developed a plan and started the transformation process. So more recent photos show a complex landscape of small farm households, each surrounded by orchards and vegetable gardens. Indigenous trees were planted, restoring forests and woodlots. Rainwater is harvested from rooftops and recycled from kitchens to gardens and orchards using contour swales and vetiver grass for erosion control. So they ensure the infiltration of water in the wet season and its gradual release into the groundwater throughout the year. That combined with the restoration of the forest surrounding the springs now enables their water supply to run continuously. The compost is used to build soil and diverse polyculture cropping was implemented. So the result has been vastly reduced hunger and malnutrition. When drought affected Zimbabwe and caused a food shortage, this village had a surplus and were able to provide food for others. And the transformation of the landscape was connected to a social transformation as well. The organization developed a participatory democratic decision-making structure uh, and they implemented conflict resolution systems, started preschools. It was truly a village-wide shift. So restored landscapes can result not only in healthy ecosystems and reduced global heating, but stronger families, livelihoods, and culture. Um, and I think I'll stop there and leave some time for questions, but thank you so much for listening. <laughs>